Hello, everybody. Welcome to San Francisco SIGGRAPH. I am Henry Labonta, and we are super excited to have Paul DeBevec with us tonight. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, what we do, if this is the first time you've joined one of our events. Um, our most recent talk was by our very own Cassidy Curtis, um, who did a, a great talk. And it is available on YouTube if you want to check it out. And then we had a couple talks on AI art, uh, as you might imagine these days, uh, prior to that. And those are also available on the SIGGRAPH YouTube channel. Um, you know, um, all, all fantastic talks. Uh, we have had some talks by um, Chris White, for example, at Weta Digital and Hal Hickel at ILM. Our programming is usually a variety of visual effects, feature animation, um, such as uh, uh, this Pixar film, Incredibles 2, uh, video games, and um, VR, and a wide variety of things. Um, these are a bit older now, but um, also great talks we've done in the past. So if you're interested in, in these kind of uh, talks, you know, please uh, follow us on Facebook, um, and uh, you'll be getting emails from us letting, letting you know about our events coming up. So we are a volunteer group um, that's a nonprofit organization. If you're not familiar with SIGGRAPH, I want to thank all my colleagues, uh, including Cassidy, uh, whose picture I need to put in here. Um, and you know, you might know that um, San Francisco SIGGRAPH is a local chapter for national SIGGRAPH. Um, so this year is the 50th anniversary of SIGGRAPH. Um, and it, the uh, conference is happening in Los Angeles in August. Um, the early registration deadline already passed, but you know it's not too late to sign up. Uh, and uh, you know Paul will be there. Um, I'll be there. Cassidy will be. A lot of us will be there. Um, that is, SIGGRAPH is the first time I learned about Paul's work. I guess in the late '90s. Uh, so you know, if you want to see the work by the next Paul de Bevec, uh, SIGGRAPH's a good place to check it out. A lot of pioneering work there. Um, so, to do the introduction for Paul, and by the way, we are recording this session, um, I'm going to switch over to a fantastic video here and, um, and use that as the introduction. So here we go. And we will do questions at the end. Um, there is a little button on the bottom of your screen that looks like three little shapes, a triangle circle. Um, that's the Q&A um, button. So you can put your questions in there anytime during the talk. And at the very end, we'll go through and, and start working through some of those questions. But thank you all for joining. Um, here's the introduction for Paul. For over three decades, scientist filmmaker Paul DeBevec has significantly affected the way we create photoreal visual effects. In college, Paul figured out a new 3D modeling process to build a textured 3D model of his car from photographs. This led to his PhD at UC Berkeley, where he extended these techniques to create sweeping virtual cinematography of the Berkeley campus in his groundbreaking 1997 film, The Campanile Movie. He then developed new techniques for high dynamic range imaging, which enabled his key invention of image-based lighting, a technique to light virtual objects with measurements of real-world illumination. Paul demonstrated these techniques in his films, Rendering with Natural Light, set in Berkeley's Eucalyptus Grove, and Fiat Lux, set in a 3D reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica. HDRI lighting is now an essential technique for adding CGI elements to real-world environments used throughout today's visual effects. Paul then pioneered the process of illuminating live-action actors with image-based lighting. In 2002, he presented Light Stage 3, the first LED stage to surround actors with images of virtual environments, lighting them with the settings the story takes place in. In 2004, Paul designed the first LED volume made from LED panels, producing smooth reflections and displaying clear images of the environments to the actors. The concepts and innovative use of LED lighting Paul pioneered with the light stage laid the groundwork for the use of LED lighting in virtual production, which has seen rapid growth as a tool for lighting actors on virtual production stages. 
and Paul's ongoing research in multispectral light sources, time multiplexed lighting and relatable volumetric capture are poised to further revolutionize the way we create television entertainment. The Television Academy is pleased to present the Charles F. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award to Paul E. DeBevick. That's, that's a great video. I, I, they failed to mention Paul has uh, been awarded two Technical Academy Awards. I think that that's worth mentioning. Um, and if you didn't get great video playback, you can always go to pauldebevick.com or debevic.org, and um, you'll see the YouTube video there. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And um, yeah, so again, thank you so much, Paul. Your uh, inspiring, innovative work has uh, fascinated me for years. So I I'm super curious about this, and clearly we have a great audience already. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Great Wonderful. to have Paul here. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's fantastic to be here. I hope people can hear me. And uh, and I see a lot of familiar faces faces in the audience. So thanks for coming and some and some and some new faces as well. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share a uh, window here. Somebody raised a hand. Is there a question here? Someone's not getting the the, the full uh, the full experience. We'll go ahead and we're going to share full screen. Or screen two, and hopefully that'll show my screen background, which is one of the light stages we've built over the years. And I'll go ahead and also uh, start up some slides. So um, anyway, thanks thanks again for uh, uh, that great introduction, and uh, thanks to the Television Academy for that cool experience that I had uh, last year. Uh, a big part of the fun was, of course, getting to uh, celebrate that with uh, a lot of uh, a very important friends that came to the ceremony afterwards for the Emmys. Uh, and another piece of fun is that uh, when they uh, recorded the, uh, the audio for that, I actually um, got to meet uh, Carl Weathers, who is the narrator uh, for the audio. Uh, and uh, I even uh, walked away with a piece of best car steel uh, declaring me now an honorary Mandalorian, which is very nice of him uh, to do. Uh, for that. And the kinds of uh, technologies that we've seen in lots of virtual productions is um, the topic of what I'll be talking uh, about today on the full spectrum of virtual production, kind of like the range of technologies that are there, and then also specifically some color rendition issues that happen when you try to light people with RGB uh, LEDs. And it's going to be work that spans things that I did um, kind of with, you know, inspired originally, as I said, from UC Berkeley, the work that I did in the in the 90s when I was a, a grad student and postdoc uh, at Berkeley. Um, and then most of the um, lighting reproduction light stages at the USC Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, and then I've gotten to um, uh, uh, complete some of this work or, or, or continue some of this work at Netflix. And uh, now I'm actually uh, in Netflix's Eyeline Studios, which is their virtual production uh, studio. And just about 50 feet over there is a sound stage that's got plenty of LEDs in it. So I actually get to work with this stuff on a daily basis these days. Um, what, what, one of the big things that happened is that I got to be part of a test that uh, the USC Entertainment Technology Center put together, because uh, I realized that uh, as, as much as these um, uh, you know, LED stages had originated with the purpose of uh, trying to light actors. Uh, and, you know, for example, in Gravity and the light box, all those LED panels were around there to provide interactive lighting on Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. Uh, at some point, the stages got big enough and the LED panels got a little denser that they started being useful as in-camera visual effects backgrounds as well. And uh, the question was, now that we're focusing a lot on the in-camera backgrounds, are they still any good for lighting people? And how good is the lighting people if you're going to bring a couple people to a virtual production stage, display imagery all around them, kind of this real world image-based lighting, does it actually light them the same way as if they were really out there in the real world? And so we set up a test where we took some real actors to real locations, recorded the lighting with HDRI maps, put it on the stage, and then saw if the actors looked the same. And this was inspired very much by uh, a really 
in inspirational, important piece of computer graphics history, which is the radiosity research done at Cornell University, because they not only published some of the earliest papers on simulating bounce light within a scene for kind of, you know, soft shadows and color bleed, um, but they also um, were like real scientists about it to the point where they wanted to show that a computer monitor displaying their simulated, you know, box world, the Cornell box, uh, looked indistinguishable to a human and to a camera as a real box um, lit from, you know, the same area light source at the top. And, you know, this was a real flex as they subtracted one image from the other. And other than like a little bit of misalignments and a couple percent differences, they basically got zero. So at that point, okay, I guess radiosity works. Um, fine to use it at, at, at this point. Um, and we wanted to see like, well, how close can we get on that? So we had our, uh, our two actors that came from uh, the USC ETC program and uh, we brought them over to Riot Studios. We shot a couple of interiors, a couple of exteriors. The interiors had light from the front, one had light from the side, one had uh, you know, kind of in, uh, in the shade and the other one was in direct sunlight. Uh, and then we went and we shot HDRI maps, which uh, we knew how to do, and we were actually very lucky to have some of our friends from Weta Digital, which has a really great um, image-based lighting pipeline over there. It's part of their FizzLight system. And um, Eric Winquest and, and uh, uh, actually assembled our HDRs, and this is part of the output of Weta's system for that. And you can see that it'll obviously light a mirror ball the way that the mirror ball looked in the scene, it'll light a diffuse ball the way that the diffuse ball looked in the scene. And you have to be very careful to capture the full dynamic range. No clipped pixel values here or else you'll miss some of the light. And in fact, we uh, did this thing where we put a thousand X neutral density filter over the fisheye lens when we're shooting in the sun for an additional set of seven exposures, um, two stops apart, so that that disk of the sun actually finally came within the range of the sensor for that last shortest exposure through the ND. Um, so armed with all of those, we went to a uh, modern virtual production stage and we got our actors lined up in there and we displayed our HDRs, we put the background plate in and this is what we got. On the left is what they really look like actually in the library of Riot visual effects and on the right um, that's what we got. Now actually I should note one thing we had to recast one of our actors because um, uh, C. Craig on the left there on the very far left uh, we, we took like an extra day or two to set up the virtual production stage to make sure it was radiometrically linear and the geometric mappings were there. And he had to go off and direct the film. So we tried to get somebody of similar skin tone, uh, suboptimal that we uh, had to swap out one of our actors. Uh, Eric Rigney there was uh, on the right, was, uh, was there for the whole show there. Um, you can see that these two images look very differently uh, lit. The background is approximately the same. The actors are way too dark. And even if you just brighten that image up to the point where the background's too bright, um, you can just tell that something's kind of off on the light and colors are a bit off. The, the directionality of the light is off. There's, there's another enough, n number of problems. And generally we found and kind of confirmed some suspicions is that the way that we've been building our virtual production stages, the fact that there's missing lighting directions, the fact that these LED panels only go up to a certain number of nits, which is less than the number of nits, you know, that's what we measure light in, it's a funny word, nits. You can say candelas per meter squared if you really want to, but that's a mouthful. Um, but the brightness that these things go to of say like, you know, 1500 nits, well, I'm looking out in the window of stuff that's probably hitting 50,000 nits, and that's, um, that's, that's, a, that's a big difference. And also kind of the, 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 the most subtle and interesting of these is the poor color rendition uh, that essentially the way that LED panels make color, it lights things funny and colors shift in weird ways. And um, we kind of noticed that in different forms in all four of our lighting conditions that we were uh, working on. But uh, by trying to be clever, and in fact, um, in most of these actually turning the whole solution around so that actually uh, the LED panels were more in front of the actors than behind them, which meant that the stage was open in the back. So we had to put some green screen behind people to eventually composite in a background. Uh, we were able to mitigate things to try to get uh, relatively good matches to the way that the light was really there in the scene. 
Um, I mentioned the dynamic range issue is a, is a big uh, problem. And some of the classic light probe images I put on my website um, back in 1999 and have gotten used in a couple of uh, SIGGRAPH papers since then. Uh, I actually went and measured like what's the brightest area and how bright is the brightest area of this light probe compared to like the average of the light probe. And you kind of need to set, you know, your panels so that, you know, like the middle gray of your scene ends up somewhere near the, you know, not, not too many stops below the middle gray of your panels. And then you have enough headroom in order to display the bright parts effectively. And that's going to be challenging because even in our most diffuse light probe image, the Uffizi gallery with that um, uh, sky that's actually, you know, overcast in that little strip, there's a 40 to 1 ratio between the pixels in the sky and uh, the, 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 the kind of the average value of the walls and the floor. And when you get to the sunny one, that little disk of the sun, that 0.53 degree subtended angle of nuclear furnace that's up there giving us, you know, light and life and all good things. Um, that's just way brighter than everything else around us. And, you know, our LED panels are not designed to do that and they'd be dangerous if they were. So we have a problem. The, um, you know, the LED stage concept that we had in the SIGGRAPH 2002 paper um, it was about 50 feet wide and had, you know, maybe a thousand lights on it. Um, the idea was actually you put a special gantry with a super bright light to play the role of the sun. And you could basically, you know, motorize that, move it around. And then, you know, you don't want every light in your stage have to be so, you know, expensive and powerful to, to, to be the role of the sun. Um, and that that was the suggestion to do that. We didn't have that on our LED stage, but we did have a cinematographer named Tim Kang who had brought a uh, nice, bright, um, broad spectrum, one by one light source, one foot by one foot. And you can see what we did is we put on a really tall light stand and uh, positioned it so that like the perspective from the lighting reference spheres, uh, it's actually uh, coming from the same direction as the sun in our environment. And Tim, uh, being a, a keen cinematographer, had measured the key to fill ratio in the original scenes brought those notes up from the shoot the previous month, and then dialed in the light until his light meter hit the same key to fill ratio with that uh, light source up there. And that ended up being um, uh, the thing that, that made it possible to light our actors with something that looked like sunlight. And that's something that we see in a lot of virtual productions is that it's not that often that you can just use the lighting off of the LED panels because real world lighting tends to be sourcier and come from more concentrated areas than the LED panels would naturally be able to do. Now you can mitigate that a little bit by bringing your scene down in brightness and then turning your exposure up in your camera, which creates headroom on your LED panels to shoot things. But then you start running into problems with bounce light bouncing off of the LED panels and kind of, you can see it polluting the black level a little bit. So there's 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 generally some challenges there as, as awesome as the technology has been. Uh, now the LED panels, uh, you know, I mentioned it wouldn't even be safe to make them all capable of going as bright as the sun or as bright as it needs to. And in fact, this sunlight here that's one foot by one foot. That's great, way bigger than that half a degree disc in the sky than the sun should really be. Um, so we thought, well, maybe we need to think about, maybe it's okay to enlarge the light sources a little bit. Maybe instead of trying to ask a tiny number of LEDs to be incredibly bright, brighter than they can be, maybe we'll recruit neighboring LEDs to add up into that illumination. And in some fair manner, we'll try to create the right amount of light from, you know, a somewhat broader light source. And that was the topic of a um, uh, SIGGRAPH uh, publication last year that I did with my former grad student, Chloe Legendre, where we had a um, process that we can pre-process an HDRI map to grow the light sources until uh, it meets a certain dynamic range requirement uh, and, um, we'll be able to produce roughly the same illumination. So this is an interior environment on the top and then uh, or on the left and then the bright light sources, you know, these little LED lights in the ceiling, we've put them through what we call a dilation process. So that now, you know, even though the pixel values go way above one in this image, and you can't tell because it's just a PowerPoint slide, um, the pixel values here below um, are clamped to one, but 
the total amount of light energy is the same and it comes from as close as possible to where that lighting is coming from. You can see here's an example where we've taken the sun and we've enlarged it. And this is a case where we really had to stop down the environment. You can see that the, the grass and the blue sky are quite dark. You'd still be able to see them on LED panels, but if we hadn't stopped it down first before starting to dilate it, the sun would have had to keep dilating and dilating till the point that it enveloped the entire sphere. And that wouldn't be a realistic simulation of the illumination either. So um, to test this out, I first did it virtually and I fired up Blender, which has a nice image-based lighting function. Uh, and I made a little arrangement of spheres and I lit it with this HDR map here, the interior and the exterior. And we got some nice lighting that looks like interior lighting, looks like exterior lighting. And then I took the HDRI maps and I clipped them at pixel value one, like a low dynamic range, just like environment map might be. And of course the lighting changed. So flipping between, this is full HDR lighting for image-based lighting, this is clipped. You know, the reflections still look pretty good in that mirror ball, but all of the diffuse components just get a lot darker because they're taking an integral over all of this lighting and the integrals are different if you clip your signal first. So if you dilate it first, you don't get back to the right answer, but you get to something that's kind of the right, it's closer to the correct lighting answer. So this is the result of lighting the scene with the dilated uh, HDRI map. And now it's a low dynamic range version of the HDRI that has the same total average pixel value and it moves the light around as little as possible. So essentially it's diffusing the light sources. And if you compare that, I'm going to flip between the actual complete rendering with full HDR and the one with the dilated lights. And you can see that the, the diffuse things stay the same brightness. The reflections stay mostly the same, except where you can clearly see the trick, which is we're enlarging the light sources. And the shadows actually get much softer as a result here. Now, this is kind of an extreme case. Um, and so it's not perfect, but maybe it's the best we can do. And I actually wondered, like, a lot of times cinematographers are going out with diffusers and trying to diffuse the sun with silks, and they tend to like big soft boxes to light faces with instead of like super pointy spotlights. So maybe in some ways it could even be more aesthetic lighting to diffuse the lighting a little bit. And so I did a test with my colleague Sebastian Silvan at Netflix. We had some LED panels in a, in a lab on loan from uh, ROE, so thank you. ROE for the uh, Black Pearl 2 V2s. And um, I guess I had about a meter and a half wide of this stuff. And I just lit Sebastian with uh, increasingly large circles of light and uh, then adjusted the exposure on the camera uh, accordingly. So that if the um, area of the light got twice as big, I'd take an exposure that's half as long and it's about the same amount of light on Sebastian. So that started out looking like this with a small circle of light. It's actually a pretty long exposure. And um, the light source subtended a two and a half degree angle. So it's actually already 25 times the area of the sun, but it kind of works. And you can see him looking like he's lit kind of with a point light. He does not look happy at this point. I don't think he was. I was making him sit there for a while. But um, you can see that there's, you know, the nose shadow here, reflection in the eye or specular on the nose and such. And then as we go through the sequence, I'm going to make the light a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. So the light's actually a lot bigger now. This is a 10 degree subtended angle. So it's four times wider and four times taller. That's 16 times the area of the light. And let's look at Sebastian. We still see an eye highlight. We still see, you know, a shadow of the nose. It's a softer shadow. Looks maybe more like what Rembrandt would paint, possibly. And there's a notable specular on the nose. Let's go a few more. Here's 14 degree angle, 20 degree angle. This looks pretty good, too. I'm still picking up a, a specular in the nose. The highlight in the eye is now clearly not just a point. It's starting to become a little larger. I see the shadow on the nose. It's diffuse. Maybe it's starting to hit soon. And yeah, Sebastian has not gotten any hat. We were supposed to go to dinner and we're late for dinner at this point. And I said, hey, can you sit down? I just need to shoot this. Um, it was actually over in about 20 seconds, but the problem is, yeah, we, 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 were, we, were, uh, we were hungry is the problem. But going a little further forward, this is where I really felt it started to break down. We've got 28 degrees of lighting. Now he's starting to look diffuse. Here's uh, 38 degrees. Actually, he's gonna get a little less happy because now the circle of light is so 
bright that actually it's like uncomfortable to look at. Um, and at this point here with 70 to one degrees of lighting, like the highlight in the eye isn't really selling. The shadow on the nose isn't really selling and the, the, the nose looks like it's not as shiny as a you know a normal nose would be. So I think you can take it too far. But the conclusion I drew from this is that it's probably in a lot of cases okay to diffuse your lights up to 10 or 20 degrees, uh, which is quite a lot of diffusion. That, that, that will gain you, you know, possibly uh, seven or eight stops of dynamic range of what you have to put on your panels for a given environment. And so maybe that's okay to do. And the other thing that's nice about the algorithm, the way that we designed it, is it basically just uses these uh, connected component analysis of the, of the saturated pixels and uh, these um, uh, dilation algorithms, which comes from like 1970s computer vision algorithms, which are you know pretty efficient to implement then. They're super efficient to implement now. So this could be real time. You know, someone could, could put this into the Unreal Engine to pre-process the stuff that you put on your LED panels if you needed to. And so we took some pictures of um, Chloe in the park, um, or in some real environments in the park and the interior. And um, that's what she will look like. We documented the lighting. We brought it into the stage. And if we don't diffuse the light and we just let it clip, then you know Chloe's basically too dark and too diffuse. And then if we um, allow it to dilate, we have those dilated versions of things, then it matches the original lighting um, quite a bit. Now, direct sunlight, I think we do have a lot of expectations for what direct sunlight should look like. If you're, if it's not like a, you know, like a glamorous close-up and it's just a person in a park in direct sunlight, you might want to try to have that special light source to do it because I think our version of it definitely is too diffused, but at least the same, you know, key to fill ratio and brightness is basically happening uh, with that. Um, we're also doing another kind of special thing to deal with a color rendition issue. So hopefully the colors on uh, the robe, the colorful robe Chloe's wearing looks um, relatively close, but that wasn't automatic to get right either. And um, the Tim Kang has a nice example of this, which is that uh, if you um, walk onto a virtual production stage, starting with a, a red pepper, a uh, an orange pepper and a yellow pepper, you will arrive on the virtual production stage with a red pepper, a very reddish orange pepper, and an orangish brown pepper. And there's a problem. So you'll see that the colors, look at the color of the orange pepper. That's the second one from the right. It, it changes uh, radically from the um, uh, tungsten illumination to the virtual production stage illumination. And in fact, uh, the gray card behind them looks exactly the same. It's been color balanced to the gray card. So it's not just that the color shifted to a color, different color in the stage. It's actually the same color of light in the stage. It's a different spectrum of light. And um, inspired by the shirt that Eric Rigney uh, wore to our virtual production stage test, uh, it was from a company called Jams World. Um, we started ordering a lot of these for like me and Xu Ming and Chloe to wear on virtual production stages. This is actually using one of Xu Ming's uh, light stage lights. And we've color balanced the, the white point of the light. Both lights are producing the same color of light, but one of them's doing it with a white LED whose spectrum is in the upper right, which is pretty broad spectrum. Um, there's a little bit of a dip in it around cyan, but other than that, it's got pretty smooth spectrum across the different wavelengths. And then on the left, this is the, the spectral graph of the light that comes out of LED stages, which has like basically a spike of red at the red LEDs, a spike of green and a spike of blue. And there's kind of a gaping chasm of unaddressed spectrum in between the red and the green. And the reason for that is that in the human eye, um, there's, uh, we've got three kinds of cones in our eyes. Sometimes we call them the red, green, and blue cones. It's a little better to just call them the, the long wavelength, the medium wavelength, and the short wavelength cones. And these panels are designed to be displays and they're designed to show a wide color gamut to the human observer. And so if you're gonna choose, you know, of your three LEDs, right? And we know we need three LEDs to show all the colors uh, and we need red, green, and blue, you get to, kind of choose what wavelengths they show up at. And in particular, if you want a saturated red and you want to excite the long wavelength cone, 
without exciting the medium wavelength cone, you have to put that red pretty deep into the longer wavelengths to the point where the medium wavelength cone is tailed off and you've still got some response on the, on the L. And in fact, um, you have to put like extra red energy because all the cones are starting to be less responsive there. So um, the, the result is, I think actually you can see, see how that red has a big peak there? The, the big peak there is because they're placing the spectrum uh, over here where like red is only half as sensitive as it would have been and the green is down at this point. So that's why there's this gaping chasm between red and green. Um, and that's what also makes this triangle inside the CIE color space a bigger triangle for a wider color gamut. Um, if you had a shorter wavelength, that red would have crept up over here and then you'd have a smaller triangle and then you don't have as, as great, you know, color gamma to, to, uh, to explain in your marketing material is amazing. So, but it turns out a LED panel with a better color gamma that's made out of red, green, blue LEDs actually has worse color rendition because look what happens here. These panels don't produce hardly any light in the orange and yellow area of the spectrum. So if you bring something that's orange or yellow into the stage, it's gonna look weird. It's probably gonna look red because it's not gonna get much credit for the wavelengths it reflects there. And one of the materials that you might find yourself bringing onto a virtual production stage is a person who has skin and the human skin reflectance looks something like this, generally speaking. And um, what you'll notice is that um, as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, this is actually basically near infrared over here on the right. But as you go to longer, longer wavelengths, skin keeps reflecting a little more, a little more, a little more light. And if you are lighting it with this kind of surprisingly long wavelength red compared to where we normally sense the red, it's going to give you this, this basically biased um, record of how much red you reflect because you're going to sample red here rather than kind of evenly over here. And you're going to make somebody look kind of pinkish or reddish. Dark skin tones tend to go straight toward red. Um, lighter skin tones, actually because of the slope here, can pick up a bit of extra blue compared to what they normally get. And uh, lighter skin tones kind of go a little pinkish magenta. So sometimes this is called the lobsterization effect. And it's a problem for virtual production stages. Cinematographers don't really like how they light anything because it looks weird. People don't really enjoy that, that color rendition being there. It's, it's just, it's like, it's, it's poor color rendition lighting. And surprisingly, it seems to be pretty unique to um, this weird combination of red, green, and blue because we're used to being lit by different spectra of light, right? This is me and my shirt in the sun, and I'm just photographing myself with an iPhone. It's me in the shade. You know, the lighting looks different, but the colors kind of came out the same. You can even stand in fluorescent light. And we know that has kind of a weird spectrum, but it's been engineered for illumination, not for display, and the shirt looks fine. And then you step onto a virtual production stage and everything goes nuts. So, um, you know, we went and measured a bunch of these spectra, you know, we kind of are able to simulate what these things look like. And you'll notice that one way to see how wonky a spectrum is, is just look at how it lights a color chart and a color chart lit by the weird spectrum of virtual production stage has like kind of a, you know, very more saturated red color here. And the orange is tinted toward um, reddish compared to the orange in the other uh, color charts. And this is after you color balance on the gray squares. So if you, if you, like one of the big takeaways of the talk is two lights can look the same color. They can light a gray car to look exactly the same and they can light other stuff to be very different because different spectra, because we only have three cones, we'll, we'll see the same, the same color for different spectra. So what can we do about this? Well, the problem was originally pointed out in kind of like the future work section of our SIGGRAPH 2002 paper. And we suggested, well, maybe a good idea would be, let's add some more LEDs to our light sources. Let's add yellow and, and turquoise LEDs to fill in those gaps in the spectrum. And in 2003, we started building lights where instead of an RGB light, we actually bought three RGB lights. We took them apart. We bought all the other LED colors we could. We couldn't really find yellow LEDs. Uh, those have only really been available recently due to new phosphor technologies. Um, but we got white LEDs and we put Lee filters over them to make the equivalent of yellow LEDs. And we got a whole range of nine different spectra and we showed that yes, indeed, 
if you use nine channels of light to simulate the spectrum of different illuminants of trying to make what a incandescent or a fluorescent or a daylight would look like, you can get radically better color rendition than naively doing it with red, green, and blue LEDs. And in 2013 or so, um, we got to the third generation of the light stage systems we were building at USC, and we had an opportunity to build um, a new uh, light stage light source. I'm actually holding one right here. Um, and uh, in addition to the white LEDs that were alternating horizontal and vertical polarization for face scanning, we added a little ring of LEDs here in the middle that you can see when they turn on. They have red, green, blue, amber, cyan, and white. So we have those six spectra. And we came up with a new way that's pretty easy to practice to drive those to get a given color rendition effect. So suppose you go out in the world, you shoot an HDRI map, and you know, you know you're in daylight or something, you wanna bring it to your LED stage, and you want it to reproduce the color rendition properties of that real environment. You don't want people to look lobstered up or anything like that. Unless, for example, you shot your HDRI map in the middle of Times Square at night, and you are actually all lit by RGB LED panels in a natural environment, then you'd want your LED stage to reproduce the slightly pinkish way that you would look like if you're walking around Times Square at night. Um, so how do, we, how do we make this part of the process? Well, the key is, instead of just shooting you know, your mirror ball, we added a black plastic ball there too, so we get a little bit more dynamic range in one shot. We still typically shoot the, the different exposures. But if you add some color charts to the scene, then basically those different spectral reflectance curves of all the different chips tell you enough of what you need to know about the spectrum to try to get it right. It certainly gives you enough information to make a color chart look right. And generally speaking, I found that if a color chart looks right in your environment, on all of the squares, then your environment's pretty good and humans are gonna look pretty good too. So here is the key. Um, in our light stage, we had six LEDs. We had red, green, blue, cyan, amber, and white. We put that color chart, the same color chart was on our kind of like our multi-spectral light probe here. And we lit that color chart with just the red LEDs, just the green, just the blue, just the cyan, just the amber, and just the white. And because of the way that light adds together, any way that our stage can make that color chart look is gonna be a mathematical linear combination of these six basis images. So if we wanna make our color chart lit in the stage look the same as it did out in the world where we're capturing the light, this is a linear algebra problem of like what coefficients times these images equals the color chart that we actually observed. Now you wanna do this with non-negative least squares because you don't want the answer that you have to drive one of the lights to a negative value. Uh, that's not that much harder. It's not any harder at all if you're using Optip or, or MATLAB. Um, and this actually shows the linear combination you would use in order to create a color chart looking like it's lit by tungsten light. Now, in addition to that, we also want like the equivalent of a mirror ball to look correct in the light stage, which means that we want the colors, the RGB color to look right for all the different directions in addition to the color chart looking the same, which is an integral of a lot of the directions. So we have a way of basically making it so that the RGB is correct from there, that the color rendition works. And these are some results from the SIGGRAPH 2016 paper, where on the left, we asked uh, our, our subjects uh, to stand out, you know, kind of like in the late afternoon sun outside USC ICT, or in the shade closer to the building. We asked the subjects to step out of frame. We got a clean plate. Then we went in, captured the lighting quickly. And then our subjects, you know, um, you know, someone chatted with them for about an hour while we prepared the image to go onto the stage. We drove all the light stage lights with that illumination and its color rendition properties. And these are photographs of those subjects in the light stage composited in to those backgrounds. And there's no manual color correction. This is just straight out of the algorithm. And they match pretty well. You now, some of you who are golden eye experts in visual effects probably can see a couple things are different other than like the hair is in a slightly different position from waiting around for an hour. Um, but we were pretty happy with that result. And enough that we could even recommend, hey, maybe we should start building uh, 
virtual production stages using this technique. And uh, the folks at SUMI Visual Effects in Beijing agreed with us, and we actually um, got into a collaboration with them to build an eight meter wide um, multi-spectral lighting reproduction LED stage for their visual effects work. So this is me actually in Beijing um, meeting with the folks after everything had been constructed. And they have since used this system for numerous uh, films and television productions, typically to insert an actor into the scene that had already been shot who wasn't really there. And they have a neat process for estimating the lighting off of the plates that they got and then driving the light stage with a good multi-spectral reproduction of that illumination to composite them in. So to show a few results from their work, you can see that guy was actually in Suvi's light stage and wasn't originally part of the scene. And he looks lit pretty well compared to um, you know, how you might just get them off of a green screen shoot. In this case here, they, uh, the actor who played him in the first season became unavailable to be in the second season. And so they had to insert him not just into the new episodes, but into all the old episodes too, because it would look weird if you had a, a different actor across the series. So it would be nice to build one of these systems out of LED panels and then have infinite resolution around you to look at images and show up in even sharper reflections. And so for a few years, I would mention to all the folks making LED panels, wouldn't it be nice if we could add a white LED at least, even before we get white, amber, and cyan, but we could add a white LED to our LED panels and then we get better color rendition out of these panels compared to what's being sold for displays. And I would point out kind of as an existence proof, you know, you can go on Adafruit.com and you can buy an eight by eight grid of Adafruit NeoPixels and every single one of them is RGBW. This is not rocket science. You can even, you know, you can buy one of these for 50 bucks today. It's just very small. So um, I'm uh, happy. I think I have to uh, unhide a slide here. But uh, as of uh, the... Um, NAB conference, which was in Las Vegas last month, um, after some, some, some needling in their own color science experiments, three of the most major uh, LED lighting suppliers or LED panel displayers now have an RGBW product, which does absolutely nothing to increase the color gamut of their panel, but it dramatically increases the color rendition of their panel. And Aoto has put them in like a neat little spiral pattern around. They've added a white LED. KinoFlow has a mimic device uh, system. It's not particularly high pixel pitch, but it's very high intensity and it has both warm white and cool white LEDs in addition to the RGB. And uh, ROE working with Brompton have a complete solution that has, you can see RGB down here and then kind of a warm white LED. And they've actually got that down to like a under six millimeter pixel pitch. And I'm told that some of these will even get them down to like the three millimeter pixel pitches that start becoming interesting for walls. But clearly these are already good products that you can put on a, on a ceiling. So this was, this was a happy kind of um, uh, completion to, to that story at that point. But it's not the completion of my talk because there are actually hundreds of virtual production stages in use around the world that we might want to try to figure out what is the best we can do if all we have is RGB. And that was the topic of a paper that I got to publish with uh, Chloe Legendre and Lucas Lepkowski and our colleagues at uh, Netflix and Scanline at last year's DigiPro conference, where we realized that um, the goal might not necessarily just to be when you're calibrating a virtual production stage to get the RGB colors that you see on stage and camera to match the RGB colors of what you're trying to send from your game engine. But actually the goal is, at least for your foreground lighting, to try to light people the way that they would look if they were actually under that illumination. And let's allow any amount of color correction either before or after you shoot them. I don't think honestly there's a way to get RGB panels to make stuff on stage look correct to the eye. But if you allow yourself to say, hey, we're going to color matrix this after we shoot it, that opens up some possibilities. And we want to address this problem that even if you calibrate your stage properly so that RGB of your scene 
that you're projecting to the display looks the same RGB as once you photograph them in the camera, the way that somebody lit by that light can look very different, in particular if they have colorful things or just have, you know, human skin. So um, the idea is that let's try to use a different post-correction matrix after we shoot it, which effectively changes the ratio of the camera sensitivity functions. And um, this uh, three by three matrix, which just means that your new RGB channels, each one just becomes a linear combination of the R, G, and B of what the camera actually shot. So you need nine numbers to make this, this matrix. Uh, we found that you can actually um, do pretty well. You can get rid of that red that you see on stage. You can kind of pull that out. And you can even restore some of the orange and some of the color of yellow just with a three by three color correction matrix. And as I mentioned, what that effectively does, or one way to think about it, is that your camera might have started with these three spectral sensitivity curves. And by saying that you're going to take everything that comes off of that camera and put it through a three by three matrix, one way to think about it is if you apply that three by three matrix to those spectral sensitivity curves, then you're going to pretend that the spectral sensitivity of the camera was actually this, this, and this. And effectively what you'll see is it makes it so that the green channel that you get out of this final process um, looks more into the middle wavelengths than just the red wavelengths to try to pull some of that red away. Uh, and the green channel gets a little bit broader as well. So it's kind of desaturating um, the, the red green axis of it. And that actually works quite a bit. You can go from things where there was a significant mismatch between charts to a much better mismatch, uh, to a much better match. The problem, however, is that if we're going to um, apply a color matrix to the stuff we shot in our camera to make it so that people look closer to the way they really should have looked, um, it seems like you're going to need to separate your foreground actors from your background because we already carefully calibrated the stage so that the background colors look correct without putting a post-correction matrix on things. And that sounds like kind of a pain to somehow rotoscope your actors off, color correct them differently than the background. And so the real observation of this paper was that we are in total control over what we put inside the camera frustum, which is the only pixels that the camera can see. And the stuff that's inside that camera frustum in the background isn't really the main source of lighting on the actor. It really doesn't matter. All the appearance I'm getting here lit by the other panels are from basically panels that aren't inside the camera frustum. So we're going to apply two different color matrices, one for the stuff that's in the frustum and one that's outside the frustum. And since we already knew how to calibrate the lighting correctly to have stuff in the background look correct, what we're going to do is take the inverse of that color correction matrix that makes people look right and use it to make the background look wrong by the same amount so that it also needs to be color corrected. And you just hit one matrix on the whole thing and it basically works out. So let's test this out. We went out, shot more HDRI environments. And the fun part of this is we had this interior, this interior, which if you take pictures during the day, it's lit by daylight. If you take pictures in the evening, you can turn the lights on and it's lit by interior warm white LED. But if you turn off all the lights when it's night, and then add your own lights, you can light that whole interior, since it's got a lot of white surfaces, with incandescent illumination, which we don't get to see very much anymore. We've kind of gone to LEDs at this point. Or um, you can bring in a couple of light wands that are LED, set them to RGB white, and you can light your entire interior environment uh, with bad RGB lighting and give it the bad color rendition that LED stages naturally produce. Or my favorite is to get yourself a low pressure sodium vapor lamp, which puts all of its energy out at 589 nanometers. Jeff Kleiser himself, who is on the call right now, has been bathed in this illumination and thinks it's uh, pretty fun stuff because it turns everything black and white. Um, and this is like the weirdest spectrum of light we thought we could light and then ask our LED stage which doesn't even produce that wavelength of light because it's only got red, green, and blue. It doesn't produce yellow. Let's see if the LED stage can do that using this map. Now, of course, if we're going to show them on an LED stage, we need to 
dilate the lights. We don't want any clipped pixel values. Fortunately, we have an algorithm for that that I described earlier. And here we go. Here's me and Chloe. We're out in the park. We got this and the um, uh, and, and the lighting here. Um, this is us now in the LED stage. And we're kind of in the shade in the park here, here in the LED stage. We're doing OK. You can see that the shirts and the skin are too colorful. We are now going to put our color correction matrix on to kind of desaturate the red-green axis of this. And now skin tones look more like they did in the original. The shirt colors look more like they did in the original. But the background doesn't have enough saturation because it looked right before we hit the, with the color matrix. And now we've desaturated everything a little bit. So what we can do is we can put the inverse color correction on the background, which will add saturation to it. So it looks a little bit more correct. However, if you compare the color chart on the LED panels from that image to the color chart that's actually in the stage that we wanted to match, you'll see this still looks kind of a bit more contrasty than that. And this was the phenomenon of bounce light rearing its ugly head in our LED stage, which is that if you're kind of using the LED stage itself for lighting, and all of those LED panels output light in all different directions, and all the panels light each other up, now, the fact that your panels reflect 4.5% of the light becomes a problem because the, back, the black square of the color chart itself reflects 4.5% of the light. And if that's being lit by the same lighting condition as everything else, you actually have to, like the right answer to show that color uh, square is to put a pixel value of zero on it, and then the bounce light itself will fill in the 4.5% reflectance. So, we don't have a super automated way to correct for that, but we did want to at least show that the other map was correct in, in theory. And so what we did is we actually turned off the background. We measured what the background looked like with the bounce light from the rest of the stage and subtracted that off. And that gave us the saturation back on the background and the black levels that we wanted back because there were, the scene itself didn't have that many pixels that dipped below that 4.5% reflectance area. And now that ended up looking pretty close to how Chloe and I actually looked in the real world. And we reproduced it on an LED stage that only had red, green, and blue LEDs, and we wore the most colorful shirts that we possibly could. So there's that whole process there for natural shade. We did that for natural sunlight. Um, the problem being here that in a natural sunlight environment, the shadows will actually go darker than the appearance of a sunlit 4.5% reflectance thing. And you just can't subtract off that much uh, bounce light. So this looks like you know some photo taken in the 1960s that didn't have a good black level, unfortunately. Um, that's another thing that LED panels are getting better at, is absorbing all the light uh, that's hitting them. And some of the recent designs are getting down to like 2% reflectance. And everyone's saying, hey, can't you just paint it with black, uh, with Vanta black? And people are looking at that kind of stuff. So I think that's going to hopefully work out. Um, let's go indoors. Here's the interior daylight afternoon, the whole process of that. Uh, originally uh, standing in the scene there and reproduced in the LED stage, and it matches pretty well. We didn't quite match the perspective in the camera fr frustum for this, but the colors kind of match. Um, here, we're now in the warm white LED. We have a color balance this to white, so we can see the natural color of the illumination versus the camera sensor. We got a pretty good match. You can see that before you do our process, way too color saturated in the LED stage compared to the original. Um, that's also true if you light your interior scene with uh, incandescent uh, illumination here. And again, too colorful, but going through the process, the color charts match, the clothing generally matches. Not perfectly, the red is still darker and redder in this version. Um, this is a fun one. This is where we lit the room with weird RGB lighting. And now the room actually does naturally have the weird color rendition properties of the LED stage. So actually the LED stage gets it correct right off the bat, but our measurements of how those three colors of LEDs like the color chart let us know that. So it actually puts a very incredibly minor color correction and the final result matches, you know, even ever so slightly better than just the natural result, which is probably fine to begin with. And then our most fun example here, is the low pressure sodium vapor light 
which here's the spectrum of this thing, a big spike of illumination at 589 nanometers, it just turns everything black and white. Well, yellow tinted black and white. And that's an actual photo not turned to black and white shot with a Canon 5D Mark III camera. In the scene, you can see no color. There's no option for any color here because all three of your camera sensors are gonna, they're only seeing one wavelength. There's only one dimension that the color can go up and down on and that's the brightness level. If you take that and you put that with a perfectly calibrated LED stage uh, and then stand on the LED stage, the background looks the same. It produces that color of light, but it produces it by mixing red and green, which are not the yellow spectrum. And so the people lit by it, um, you see all the reds and greens in their clothing. It doesn't sap the color out of you and you don't look even close to the way that you did in the sodium vapor light. But if you let our algorithm take a look at what a color chart looks like under those LEDs, it realizes that the post-correction matrix needs to squeeze the color down to monochrome yellow, which a linear transformation matrix has no trouble doing. And boom, now it looks like it's lit by sodium vapor light, even though it was shot in the virtual production stage, which can't even produce anything close to that wavelength of illumination. It's not exactly the same photo. Look at the, the yellow patches on my shirt in the upper left are much brighter because they actually reflect that yellow in a really big way compared to here, but the character is maintained at least. There's original scene, this is how bad it looks with um, the LED stage, and then with the final black level subtraction, that's how close we got, and then there's the shirt down. So the question might be at this point, well, okay, did we really need the RGBW panels? Did this get good enough that we could just use RGB uh, panels and do this color correction thing. And the thing is that, as I showed, there are still color rendition issues with colorful fabrics. The lighting does not look good on set. Um, and there's all the other issues um, there. So, you know, it's probably good that we have the RGBW uh, on the way. And that certainly, I think, is a no-brainer to, if you're sealing of your stage, like, make that at least out of RGBW. But it also poses the question, um, we're going through a lot of trouble to get this lighting right on the set. Maybe it would be easier if we just did the lighting in post, for example. Um, a lot of movies these days, like, you know, uh, Avatar, which uses another flavor of virtual production, don't even bother lighting the actors when they're acting because they're going to turn into virtual characters that you can light however you want in post-production because they're CGI. Uh, what if we could film our real actors in a way that you can like them however you want after the fact. And that's been another line of our research that we started at USC ICT back in the day with uh, what we call like um, performance relighting with time multiplexed illumination. So our SIGGRAPH 2005 paper put actors in this light stage and there's white LEDs all around them. And we very rapidly lit them from different directions as we filmed them with a high speed camera going a couple thousand frames per second. And the result is that you can light somebody, like in the course of a frame of film, you can get 100 lighting passes on them. And then you can mix and match all those lighting passes to relight a performance, like with the light of Grace Cathedral or the light of the Uffizi Gallery. It can be exactly the same performance, but you put it together. Here's a friend of ours uh, named Lucas who came in from the Canadian Discovery Channel. And we lit him giving a performance with about 30 different passes of light. And so here's exactly that same performance, will slightly phase shifted in time by thousands of a second, and lit all different ways. This is really fun for studying lighting because you can see like every different direction you light him, you, his expression on his face looks a little different. The mood of the scene looks a little better, uh, a little different. And if you take those images, tint them the different colors of the light coming from an environment, and then add them all together, you can show Lucas the way he looks like lit by the light of the Galleria degli Uffizi, or lit by the, uh, or that's Grace Cathedral, or lit by the Uffizi Gallery. Very different lighting, and all simulated after the fact. We didn't have to light Lucas at all. Um, we took this a little bit further and thought, well, it'd also be nice to be able to change the viewpoint on him too, right? Let's 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 do a volumetric capture that's relightable too, and that was the whole point of Light Stage Six, where. For in 2006, we built an eight meter stage with white LEDs everywhere. We shot with these vision research high speed cameras at thousands of frames per second. And if you take Bruce from our lab here and um, you know, uh, have him do the very easy task of uh, running on a spinning treadmill while lights blink, 
um, you can see that we're actually getting all of these lighting passes on and interleaved with each other, which allows us to um, then computationally relight him uh, any way that we uh, need to. So we also got him effectively seen from 108 viewpoints all around him from the sphere. Um, we got an alpha channel for him with a combination of a retroflective map uh, for front projection on the, on the treadmill and a time multiplex map in the background. This is some image-based relighting on him just from the front camera. And then by constructing something that's, you know, kind of like a light field nowadays, uh, we use the, uh, the spiritual successor of these things called NERFs uh, to represent this. Then you can relight it appropriately. It's actually a relightable light field or a reflectance field. And then you can insert Bruce into an environment and have it lit by that light. We even found a way to calculate the correct shadows that he'd have on the ground and give him a little bit of company as a virtual avatar going into these environments. And you know, even though this work was done, I guess, over 15 years ago now, uh, we realized something that would probably help this um, take off a little bit more in adoption is if we could find a way to do it without having to use such expensive high-speed cameras. And so a thousand frames per second is a little bit of an ask, but 60 frames per second is something most cameras can do, or 48 frames per second. And if you want 30 frame per second output and you're willing to shoot at 60 frames per second, you can get at least two lighting conditions in on somebody every time. Uh, and so at Google, we built a light stage and we came up with a way of lighting people with two lighting conditions that we call the color gradients. And it's basically all the lights are on, but like the red channel of the lights gets bright to dark going right to left, the green channel gets bright to dark going top to bottom, and the blue channel gets uh, bright to dark going front to back. And then we reverse it for the next pattern. So the sum of those two lighting patterns is white light from everywhere, which shows you a diffuse texture map. But the difference between those two patterns divided by the sum actually computes a photometric normal map. We're lighting people up like normal maps. And if you've got a normal map, you've got a leg up on relighting somebody. And that's exactly what we did with our first pass of relatable volumetric capture. We had some infrared cameras with specially constructed dot patterns. This is Christoph uh, from the project lit up like a normal map. They had some good temporally stable mesh work going on here. And um, you can even pull a little bit of a spatially varying specular map out of that data too for gloss. And here we're taking Christoph and uh, compositing him into the Spruce Goose building uh, of Google down in Playa Vista. And there's uh, Sergio as well um, as a volumetric capture and we're relighting him in, in, in V-Ray with some new HDR maps. So this, I think, moved the ball forward in terms of relightable volumetric capture. And it inspired also some machine learning research that we did where we thought, well, it's great now to be able to relight people who have been in the light stage, but what if you just have film of a person that wasn't shot in a light stage? Can you relight that? And in the age of machine learning and deep learning, you think like, well, wait, maybe if I show uh, an ML algorithm lots of examples of what a person looks like lit with one lighting condition, but now here's what they look like in a different lighting condition, it can generalize to figure out how to relight people. And by bringing a lot of people into the light stage and lighting them from every direction light can come from, we came up with exactly the illumination and the data sets that we needed to do this project from SIGGRAPH uh, 2021 called Total Relighting. And essentially what it does is if you give it a photo of somebody or even a group of people, it will hallucinate an image of what they look like with very flat lighting. It'll hallucinate a normal map. It'll hallucinate a specular map. Uh, it will guess their alpha channel and reconstruct their foreground element because one of our things we shoot in the light stage is a good alpha channel for people. And then you can um, computationally relight somebody, their video or their photo after the fact, even if it's just stuff shot with a regular camera out in some unknown lighting environment. And it's not as great as having people on, on set or in the, in the, in the, in the light stage, uh, but we were pretty happy with this because this is stuff that, you know, 
back at SIGGRAPH 2000. We had no idea this would even be possible. So nowadays, we're even starting to see uh, some features added to compositing software that tries to do uh, relating, and it's using some ML algorithms that probably you know, have some relationship to these kinds of things. And it's really exciting to see these becoming artist tools. If you happen to own a, a Google Pixel phone, you can also bring up the portrait relate feature and fire up a version of this algorithm uh, for that. So I have now been talking for an hour. That's I, I promise to stop after that. Let me uh, thank um, at least a subset of the many collaborators who have um, uh, been part of this project over the years. I'd like to thank the San Francisco chapter and the cool people who helped set this up. Uh, and then there's the websites uh, there for me and the USC lab, and then an email that you can reach me at uh, if you need to for any reason. And I can stay around for, for some period of time and try to answer some questions, but thank you for all those little clapping hands there. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. Wow, amazing. Always innovating. <clears throat> is there is a Q and A uh, Q here? I see one person found it. It's on the bottom right, the triangle, square, circle. And you press the Q and A thing. Um, and Paul, I'll just read out one of these. Due to the lighting issues and the need for post-color workflow. Would you recommend a green screen over an LED volume for live virtual sets? Um, great question. So, you know, one of the things I saw at NAB, you know, was a setup that just it, it had a they had a side by side. Somebody set up a green screen with some you know flowers and a and a table in front of it, and then they had the same flowers and table set up in front of an LED volume. And one was doing real time chroma keying, and the other one was doing you know. The, the LED volume work. And since they had set up the same lighting on both of them, both looked just fine. It was great. Green screen's a great technique. You can even do real-time stuff with it. Um, I think the key in both cases are, are you lighting your foreground subject right? And making a good composite, you know, part of it's about the mat and getting that nice edge and getting the right motion blur alpha channel and all of that. But so much of that final appearance is, does the lighting on the foreground look appropriate for the background that you've put them into? And um, neither one of these, these techniques of, of either green screen or LED volumes, the way that they're built today, just solve that out of hand. So that's something you have to, have to do. And um, yeah, I think both, both, are, both are great technologies. And, and um, you know, the, the being on a green screen all day can be a little, a little challenging. I, I had fun with the SIGGRAPH 2002 paper. We actually put an infrared screen behind the actors. There was a black cloth that reflected infrared light and we recorded the alpha channel with a second camera through a beam splitter of the actors silhouetted against a field of infrared. And we got really great maps and then we could control all the lighting and there's no green still. Very cool. Here's another question. What are your thoughts on using NERFs for virtual production and VFX? Can NERFs solve certain problems with lighting virtual production given their additional volumetric lighting information of the scene? Yeah, great question. NERFs are so cool. And I think that they're, uh, you know, a great way to represent scenes. So I think that you know what we saw in that volumetric capture work totally makes sense to do that with NERFs these days. And one of the things that's inside a neural radiance field is that you can evaluate them everywhere in the volume to figure out an opacity and an RGB color. But that RGB color actually depends on uh, querying it with what direction you're going to look at it from which means that a neural radiance field can encode view-dependent reflectance in a way that a lot of photogrammetry models don't. Now, back when I did the Berkeley Tower model with photogrammetry for, for, uh, for the facade system, we actually did have view-dependent texture maps where all of the photos you took of the scene were indexed and kept around at render time so that it would render, it would use the pixel values from the image that was closest to the virtual viewpoint that you're trying to render. So we did get view-dependent reflectance into the photogrammetry back then, and it helped. Um, NERFs have a much more elegant way of encoding that. So you'll get kind of some luster of the surfaces. Um, NERFs can trip up a little bit with very shiny surfaces because it's um, easier to encode uh, a reflection off of a mirror sometimes as a mirror version of the world that's going, you know, that's behind the scene, rather than every single, um, you know, 
volumetric point on the mirror encodes an image of the entire scene reflecting on it, which can take a lot of network capacity. So I haven't really seen NERFs that are great at particularly shiny stuff. But something that's very important is that view-dependent reflections are very different than lighting or relightability. NERFs, the way that they're proposed at the moment, are fixed lighting, not relightable. They'll look different colors from different angles, just like the real world will, even without changing the lighting because of specular reflections. But relighting NERFs is hard. Um, I'm a co-author of a SIGGRAPH paper that tried to do it called NERF Factor to try to turn a NERF into, from radiance into reflectance, which point it would be a neural reflectance field, but I guess that's also still a NERF because it's still an R. But um, that's an active area of research and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing more practical solutions in that direction. Um, one other question. What challenges does the RGB wall industry face with mass manufacturing RGBW panels? What about in 10, 20 years? Is it possible to see multi-primary LED wall, RGB, cyan, yellow, emerald for greater spectral and color gamut coverage? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing it today, right? We've got RGBW today. There's another group that's done RGB cyan. As it turns out, if you look at that image of the horseshoe-shaped CIE color space, and you're looking at how do I make that triangle of gamut bigger, like which, which LED spectrum or color would I add to, to make it into a, a bigger area? Then you get like a quadrilateral-shaped uh, spectrum. The right answer for that is actually cyan. You can, um, uh, strangely enough, you can cover more. The answer is not yellow, even though there's that big gap between red and, and green, because there's so much overlap between our long and medium wavelength cones, you can make a very satisfying yellow out of red and green without ever putting any um, yellow in, because you get the same response of your, of your uh, long and medium cones. It also helps that the short wavelength cone stays out of the picture mostly, and so you can totally see the same thing with two wavelengths here on red and green or one wavelength in the middle. So you really don't get you can barely expand your gamut at all by adding a yellow LED. You can improve your color rendition uh, for that. But I, I saw one demo from the, like the 6P color group and they had RGB cyan. And dear gosh, you know, occasionally it shows things that are, you know, a color you wouldn't normally see on television. And my brain didn't know how to process it. I just think I've looked at screens all my life and I haven't expected to see that color and it just looked weird. <laughs> but maybe eventually you get used to it. I don't know, HDTV looked a little weird to me at first too. Um, so in five or so, so I think that we'll have, I think RGBW, you know, if you go back to the, the 2016 paper, um, we showed that, you know, with RGB amber, cyan, white, you can get like a 99% accurate color rendition in most cases. Uh, with RGBW only, you can get almost 98%. So I think that's a good, pretty good practical solution. Simulating incandescent lights is a little tricky because you, you kind of have to turn the white LED all the way off, otherwise there's too much blue in the scene, and so you're stuck back with your red and green again. So that might be an issue, but um, I think that's gonna happen pretty pretty soon. In five to 10 years, you don't even bother shooting any actors, just ask some AI to make it. Yeah, I have a, a completely different question. I'm, I've, I've always been curious, have you ever talked to any film DPs about the work you're doing? <laughs> I'm curious what they would think. Yeah. Oh, I love talking to D, uh, DPs about this. Um, I've found that there is a certain, uh, you know, group of DPs that are, you know, incredibly technically minded, but they actually span all the way to the artistic practice of this stuff. And you can have fascinating conversations. I've learned so much. So these are people like David Stump, uh, you know, Tim Kang. Uh, and then there's other DPs who like are so good at the art. They're just incredible artists. And you won't necessarily find out, you know, like they, they aren't even able to explain themselves. Like ask, you know, ask, ask Mid Journey to explain how it can produce such great art. It doesn't have good answers for you. I think that, you know, true artists often, it's just kind of innate. They know some things, but so much of what they do, it's like a little bit harder to, to explain. And we, we can just enjoy their work and hope that they'll find these tools useful at some point. No, none of, no DP looks, likes, how things look in a VP stage though with the with the color rendition. I've never heard that. Yeah. After hearing your talk, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Uh, there's one in the chat here. Oh, there's two actually. Is the open VP Cal uh, SIGGRAPH talk available online? 
I don't know. That's uh, stuff Carol Payne at all. Uh, we're working on. It's a great way of calibrating the RGBs of the panels to be the same as the RGBs going out from your Unreal Engine once they're photographed by the camera. And uh, there was a good talk given at SIGGRAPH. I know that there's online, you know, the papers online and such. And uh, uh, we, we we can try to look into that. Um, I, I would try to reach out to to Carol Payne for that if you can find her. Cool. Uh, Alex has a question too. LED ceiling panel as the lighting source. Everyone starts to add W RGBW or WW RGBWW. Eventually, it will get to RGB A C W. But for LED backdrop as displaying content, do we need to add any other colors beside RGB? Does yeah, I mean, sense? yeah, white or amber. Great for color rendition, you know, and if for some reason you really like uh, uh, cyan, go ahead and add a cyan for color gap. Yeah. Um, I think, oh my, oh my. Now we've gotten a whole bunch of work. Uh, do you need to wrap up pretty soon, Paul? I think, I think I've got like um, five, five or 10 minutes. Five, five or 10 minutes. Uh, okay. Well, um, Barry has a question. Hi, Barry. Uh, what was the name of the Russian researcher that did the IR reflection mat extraction in the, in the 1050s, 1950s, I think you mean? So I went back, because I, I, I was writing a background and related work section for a paper because I asked ChatGPT to do it, and they did impressive work, but I couldn't really use it. So I had to write it myself. And I went back to my uh, 2002 paper. So there's a, there's, I think, the infrared practice was used uh, for some Russian films on film, and we, you know, running an infrared um, film, and then also a, 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 a possibly even in black and white for the for the uh, visible. Um, but since infrared light doesn't um, go through camera lenses like quite the same as visible light, usually when you're designing a lens like like there's this problem of dispersion, right? So like light goes and it refracts and the different wavelengths refract a little bit differently. So think that that album cover of the Pink Floyd album with the prism and the white light comes in here and it spreads out into a rainbow. Now imagine that rainbow hitting your image sensor and showing tons of chromatic aberration. That's what you know lenses would do unless really smart lens designers and lens design software put lots of groups and elements made out of crown class and flint class to solve some crazy quartic equations to try to get red and green and blue light all to show up at the same place on the sensor and usually they end up solving this in a way that gates essentially the place that the light ends up um according to wavelength can be approximated well with a cubic and the roots of that cubic equation are basically in red and green and blue at the peaks of the three places where your sensor tends to sense light and they just give very little care to where the infrared light shows up because there's an infrared blocking filter in front of all of it and we're not trying to sense infrared light so the infrared light tends to show up kind of blurry and um the wrong size on the sensor and they sure as heck had that problem back in the in the 50s um the um they'd have to reprint the mat just slightly different size to actually line up and that's one of the motivations of the sodium vapor process because they started using sodium vapor light for compositing and that actually puts the matte image right in the middle of the visible spectrum in yellow so it focuses perfectly well with everything else it's actually super sharp because it's a single wavelength now when i did infrared compositing in 2002 i used leds to generate the infrared light instead of the ir light that spews out of incandescent sources and that made it was much more localized in terms of its wavelength spread so actually it gave a pretty sharp image on the sensor because it's a limited range of uh, wavelengths and it wasn't just spreading out everywhere. And also I was in the digital era where I can just put a calibration grid up and I can resize my infrared image to match to the visible image and we had no problems with it whatsoever. But anyway, going back to the paper, um, the first reference actually 1948 by Leonard B. Pickley and if you look in the patent literature, you can see his uh, patent on uh, infrared uh, mapping that was proposed there. And then it was um, kind of written up in the in the Simpty Manual in 1960 by Zoli Vidor. Wow, very cool. Okay, Jeremy, I see there is a reply to your question in the chat. 
Um, so I'll go to the next one. Why are you not importing everything to a different color space other than RGB for the color matching part? For example, some variations of cylindrical HCL lab um, where colors with a shorter Euclidean distance are perceptually similar. Great question. I think the main the main thing is we need to do linear algebra on all of this stuff, and I think some of those color transforms keep things linear, and some of some of them don't. Like if you go and turn it into a cylindrical space where there's like an angle for hue, um, now you can't do math on it anymore, and we're we're surviving by doing math on stuff uh, at this point. It has been pointed out that the CIE 1931 color space that we still use, like. What if you were one of the people who worked on the CIE 1974 color space? Like, no one uses it. They went, they fixed so many problems of CIE 1931, and everyone just seems to do CIE 1931 at this point. It's known to be perceptually nonlinear, so there's some areas of that horseshoe where moving around a little bit makes a big change versus some where it doesn't make a big change. Um, overall, though, we're trying to get it so it's pretty close, and ultimately, we want it to look good for cameras, and cameras are a bit more well behaved because if you look at the spectral response of like a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel, they're kind of equally sized, equal chunks of the spectrum. So a lot of those issues are, are at least different for cameras and I think a little bit better conditioned uh, for cameras. But that's, that's important to note that, you know, these things are not necessarily um, perceptually uniform. And I think mostly we try to protect ourselves by saying like, if we can get the answer so it's within, 1% correct on a, on, a, on a camera, you know, in terms of the math, you know, human brightness, like we're more sensitive to brightness than the color, right? And we know that a just noticeable difference in brightness is about 1%. This is why like OpenEXR, which has a 0.1% difference in brightness jumps is fine for images that you wanna show. Um, and if we're more sensitive to brightness, and that's a 1% thing, if we're within 1% of color, we're probably good. And that's what we looked at in our 2016 paper. I, am. I probably deeply offended a color scientist or two with that, so I apologize. Uh, up to you, Paul. Should, there's two more questions. Should we go for it or um, call it quits? Let's, uh, 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 let's t give me the better of those two questions. Um, you know, I'll, 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 my casual, uh, I'll, I'll say this one. Have there been any attempts at using the estimated normals and position of an actor within an LED stage to relight actors to add in specularity? That's, that's a great thing. That sounds super fun. Um, tell me how you get those normals. I think that would be a cool thing. And um, yeah, why not? And let, let's, let, let's try to get those specularities to look better. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great thing. Please work on that, submit it to SIGGRAPH 2024. That'd be fantastic. All right, all right. I'm gonna just share this to thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate it. And uh, Leonette for, um, and, and your studio, Netflix Eyeline Studios. Um, our next events are going to be uh, an Avatar Wakanda event that uh, a speaker from Weta is going to do. We're still arranging that, and also a DreamWorks event um, uh, on Puss in Boots. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope to see you guys at um, some of our future events. Thank you everybody for joining. Fantastic presentation! Wow, just kind of mind blowing stuff. I really appreciate it, Paul. Okay, thank you, Henry. Thanks, SFC Graph. Thank you. Yeah, see you there. <laughs>